A hearty good afternoon uh, to everybody here. Thank you so much uh, for pitching and for attending. We are now in plenary session three. My name is Andre Kiet. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Engagement and Transformation at Nelson Mandela University. Our thematics for the, for the session is Engagement and Transformation. And I will now immediately hand over to Prof. Tonsen, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Zululand, to introduce the session to us. And I will refer you to the bio notes in the conference perspective but, but to see uh, the more uh, expanded uh, CV of, of Prof. Tosi. Prof. Tosi, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Chairperson of the session, Professor Kiet. Um, Chairperson of for you, uh, Vice Chancellor Yusuf, Professor Sbongle Mutwai, and Vice Chancellor of uh, and Principal of Nelson Mandela University. Colleagues, all of you, protocols observed. Um, um, I'm honored to deliver the opening remarks to this session of reimagining engagement and transformation. Though, what I will say in my remarks uh, may be categorized as intellectual thought, I would like to offer a disclaimer that this in fact is an abstract emotion, my abstract emotion for the theme, topic of engagement is very close to my heart. Before one is a professional, one is personal. And that is the concise distillation of sociological imagination theory as explained by Wright. This session intends and brings an ambition to share the vision of an engaged university, which is one that goes beyond mere public social understanding, but that enters into the authentic public social engagement that is alive and consistent. And my remarks today are grounded on none other than our African philosophy of Ubuntu, its values and, princi and, and principles. And my remarks must be received as an injunction of to perfectly bring about the reality and effectiveness of an engaged university carving rigorous transformation. Paraphrasing Becky's preface on Koda's visionary book, he says, Ubuntu cherishes the idea of putting people first, all people, and we must foster a sense of African solidarity, ban the torch of moral, social, and responsibility, and engage ourselves in a pragmatic and demonstrative engagement. This quotation captures a number of pivotal elements of what I believe constitute an import, important features of the spirit of Ubuntu. And these are creating bonds, collectivism, interconnectedness in an open and rounded way and social responsibility, responsibility about all of which I am here to say that should we endeavor to achieve so as to embed in the heart of our now being reimagined, transformed South African universities. Clear, you do not want me to, to you don't want to tell, me, to tell you that academia is not a solitary, lifeless event in a society, but a living organism which must breed hope and inspire transformation and development in communities and beyond. Therefore, a university as an academic institution must be engaged in its wider society. But what is it that constitutes an engaged university? One, an engaged university regards public society as an equal partner in the realization of delivering compact, relevant, and quality education. It does not regard the community as an addition to its existence and function which it occasionally works with. Number two, an engaged university alongside performing its duties in a society infuses the society into the fabric of its being and approaches function of teaching and research. Number three, a true and committed engaged university is proactively cognizant 
of the vital need to incorporate social engagement into the elements to constitute and describe its existence, teaching research knowledge, and exchange and sharing of social responsibility. The engaged university therefore must, and we should make it, to build a momentum of integrative force of engagement. That way we will be able on the, will be on the right of achieving their social cohesion, encouraging human solidarity, and serving the highest form of justice, social justice. So let us fertilize the ground through this debate and sow the seed to germinate a transformed Africa and the world, and let us shape our reality. I will leave you with the words that the imperative in front of us is that we should refuse to let our communities, our nations, accuse us of being devoid of understanding and knowing them, of helping and working with them. That is not or should never be the story about us. A time has come for the universities to really be engaged. And I thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Prof. Tonsen. Uh, beautiful on both counts, substance as well as time management. Highly appreciated, Prof. Tonsen. You are setting the scene very well for Dr. Tandi Luan, who works in the Department of Higher Education and Training as the Chief Director for Institutional Governance and Management Support in the University Education Branch, and Professor Sibongile Mutwa, who is the USAP chair and also the vice chancellor of Nelson Mandela University. Dr. Lewin will go first for 30 minutes and then I'll hand over to Prof. Mutwa as well. Do uh, make your comments land in the chat box and the Q&A uh, Q uh, space. Patrick will distribute it into our uh, space over here and uh, I'll make sure that um, if we have time that the speakers respond to it. Many thanks. Uh, Dr. Lewin. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kiet. Um, it's good to see you. Um, also, greetings to Prof. Mtose and Prof. Mutwa. Um, honored to be on the same platform. Uh, both are currently chairpersons of task teams that uh, I'm working on. Um, Vice Chancellors, uh, honored guests, colleagues, and friends. Thanks very much for inviting me and uh, as a representative of the Department of Higher Education and Training to speak at this important conference where we are grappling with what it means to be engaged universities. So my topic, the year in review, is uh, a nice bureaucratic topic. Uh, on the one hand, a great opportunity to reflect on the recent effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on our higher education system and our response to that, and also an opportunity for us to point to some ideas going forward. Um, the idea of COVID-19 provoking a crisis is perhaps not an entirely accurate way to describe what has happened over the past 18 months or so in South Africa, as in some ways we've become used to the dis disjuncture and crisis um, in the higher education system. And, and both global and local factors have impacted on this. Um, financial sustainability concerns uh, remain very high on the list, um, changes to teaching and learning, questions about the nature of our higher education curriculum and pedagogies, the growing complexity of leadership and management, the effects of technological change on higher education, the need to respond to many environmental and social challenges facing the world. Many of these have been um, outlined so eloquently in earlier presentations, um, issues of inequality, poverty, unemployment, the effects of climate change, violence, political intolerance, the big questions that are facing humanity. Our own experience in South Africa of the past six or so years has been one of responding to rapid social and environmental changes, and at the same time, continuing to tackle what it means to be a relatively small but critically important university system in a developing country and a developing region, and a system which is still struggling to free itself from an unequal and unjust history. However, what the pandemic did to us and perhaps did for us is to put into the spotlight again the fault lines in our system and society and remind us of the work that still needs to be done to address the epistemic, digital, educational and social injustices in our system. 
So in many ways, the COVID pandemic has sustained uh, in some way, but also spotlighted a series of quite profound challenges for higher education and added urgency to addressing these. Um, I, I was thinking back to March 2020, which is not all that long ago, but does seem very long ago now. And uh, it seems so different too. Um, I remember the first consultative meeting we had um, where the Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation met with higher education and post-school education stakeholders in the, in the USAF boardroom. It's a very small boardroom and we had more participants than expected. And we were quite used to having packed meetings at that stage, but within a week after that, these kinds of meetings were an absolute thing of the past. In fact, I remember being quite anxious at that meeting and I, I can't quite recall, but I'm fairly certain that we were not yet wearing masks. Um, so these were the early days. And I also remember shortly after that, going to a, an event, a, a higher education event and, and hugging a friend and then worrying for days afterwards if, if I could have infected them without knowing it. So those were the early days of the pandemic. And now, of course, wearing a mask, sanitizing, social distancing, meeting online and getting vaccinated are part of our day-to-day -day life. And they are critical for our shared humanity, for protecting ourselves and protecting others. In terms of the uh, 2020 academic year, um, so if we think back to that time, our first meetings were with the scientists. What did they know about the virus and what would this mean for universities? The academic year had only just started for 2020. If students were to go home, would they be able to return? When would they be able to return? What about classes? Um, how, how would they happen? What about research? What about meetings, internet connections, data costs, equipment? All of these things were occupying our minds and meetings and shared correspondence at the time. However, in many ways, after the initial shocks, the universities were able to adjust admirably. And I think we would agree that a high level of collaboration and sharing of ideas, as well as a lot of planning and energy assisted in keeping the academic year on track. Um, I think Prof Bauer spoke a little bit about this earlier, but I'll focus a little on what we did as a system in 2020 um, and also on the support that the department provided to the university system. Um, much of this may be known by some of you, many of you may not know all of this as well. But the first thing to say is that, of course, much of the normal work that allows the system to keep operating continued. Funding was transferred, support programs continued, um, monitoring intensified for sure. Um, infrastructure development was affected by the lockdowns, but it picked up again later in the year. Research continued and conferences moved online. Travel stopped, but the work continued without travel. Um, for us, government officials, parliament also moved online, and we reported regularly to the Portfolio Committee on the work and the planning underway, particularly with a focus on what was happening under COVID. The department worked very closely with the 26 public universities to develop remote multimodal teaching, learning, and assessment plans for each institution, recognizing that while a common sectoral approach to saving the academic year was necessary, saving lives as well, and supporting student success, each university developed different mechanisms and plans for the completion of the academic year in their own contexts. Funds to support the teaching and learning plans of institutions were identified through a reprioritization exercise to create a COVID-19 responsiveness grant. Um, this was allocated to the universities in partial support of some of the costs of implementing the, the plans and, and both at the teaching and learning side and on the health and safety side. Um, it must be noted that while the institutional plans were different across the system, institutions also had to take into account um, the different support needs of their student bodies and staff uh, complements. And so there was a variety of methodologies underway and no singular approach uh, by any one institution. So there was a, a whole lot of different methodologies, development of online teaching and learning materials. There was both synchronous and asynchronous methods used, development of print-based teaching and learning materials in some um, in some areas, some really quite amazing stories of, of uh, materials being delivered to students all over the country. Um, the uploading of teaching and learning materials to USBs, delivery to students as well. Uh, development of alternative assessment strategies and catch-up programs when students came back to campus. Um, and so the university's uh, plans addressed many of these things. Uh, also, uh, a very significant focus on ICT infrastructure on both hardware and software upgrading learning management systems, uh, bandwidth, um, IC, uh, cybersecurity and ICT security issues, etc. Um, quite significant distribution of data to students and staff. 
um, and quite a, a lot of a huge growth in, in training for staff and students um, because of the need to suddenly work with alternative teaching and learning strategies. All our universities were able to complete the 2020 academic year, albeit uh, by March 2021. There was a static, staggered approach to completing the 2020 academic year. Um, and then many universities also uh, started the new academic year in, in, in uh, a staggered fashion. We had uh, developed criteria for a phased in risk adjusted approach for return to university campuses. We did this collaboratively as a system. We worked with uh, representatives of universities and the CHE. Uh, and we work quite closely with higher health to, to uh, identify the, uh, what needed to be done in terms of the national disaster and the different uh, risk levels. We gazetted criteria for return to campus in June, um, which provided quite detailed guidelines for the process from June uh, to December in terms of return to campuses and the safe, the safe return to campuses and residences. Um, at the time, under level three um, and level two of the lockdown, um, all universities had COVID-19 task teams and we worked closely with the major network operators. Uh, Prof Bauer spoke about this earlier. Data bundles were provided, uh, special rates were negotiated, uh, etc. So these are some of the things that, that happened. Of course, once students were able to return to campuses, they were able to access on-campus Wi-Fi networks. Uh, data provision in terms of our monitoring of the system remained quite high. The average across the system for undergraduate students was 88% and 87% for NISFA students. Um, as reported by institutions, we were receiving uh, at the time, if you remember, we were getting reports every two weeks from institutions. A number of institutions uh, put in place mechanisms to provide electronic devices to students. Uh, this wasn't possible for all institutions. And of course, in many cases, there were delays as a result of the, the, the high demand for devices globally as a result of the pandemic. Um, there were delays there. The extent to which students who needed laptops, however, was, was uh, and were supported to obtain these very quite widely. So in some universities, there were very few, and those are universities that were mainly making use of paper-based materials for students. But uh, over 70% of students in 18 institutions uh, were able to access the devices that they needed. Um, of course, the devices on their own were not enough to, to ensure adequate access um, to online learning, but uh, certainly there's been vast progress in the 2021 academic year. Um, the department worked very closely with the, with the universities this year on their returning plans, and we are still monitoring the system, uh, albeit on a, on a less frequent basis. Uh, there's been incredible cooperation from institutions and um, uh, despite the fact that the, the, the monitoring burden has gone up and the reporting burden has gone up. Uh, the other thing that happened last year is NISFAS students continued to receive their allowances for the academic year, uh, even when they were off campus, uh, and some students are also qualified for extended academic year allowances. So, so a whole range of initiatives in different areas, and the department also negotiated a framework for tuition and accommodation fees, um, which was implemented across the system in order to mitigate against additional costs for tuition and accommodation, uh, and to support institutions in engaging with private accommodation providers. Um, so some of these initiatives were really quite important um, at, at, the, at the time. Um, and again, we've, we've published directions this year, they are guiding the year, as it, going, as it goes on, we're continuously monitoring. Um, we're working with the CHE on the meta evaluation of te teaching and learning under the new circumstances. Um, and we uh, know that USAF and the CHE have undertaken a survey which is focusing on the challenges faced by academic staff. Um, we did a survey on the access to learning materials by students, which I will talk to in a, in a little bit. Um, and, and we have requested universities to submit 2021 learning, teaching and assessment plans. So we're learning a lot from this period and um, maybe some of this you know, and those who are in institutions will know that the story might look very different at institution level as it does at national level. Um, but I've focused very much on the COVID related responses, but in many ways, the regular work of universities and the system continued. Uh, and there's many, much other work that the department did, which I, I won't go into, there's not, there's not a lot of time for that. But despite the challenges, much of the regular work continued. 
And I would like to say this, that from my perspective working in government, one of the most positive aspects of the past 18 months has been the way in which the sector has collaborated and worked together to manage the response to the pandemic. And I think this bodes extremely well for the sector going forward. In terms of funding and financial sustainability, it's a major concern for universities and the system as a whole. In 2020, as you know, we faced reductions as a result of the strain on public finances. These reductions continued into 2021, and as you know, we also had to reprioritize funding in order to support a shortfall of funding for the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, where demand has put considerable pressure on the available funding from the state, despite, I must say, a budget that has grown exponentially over many years. This puts a great deal of pressure on us to find a sustainable solution to student funding and system funding in the next period, um, and when the fiscus is really likely to be under continued pressure. Student debt is also growing. Uh, as of 2019, student debt in the system sitting at about approximately 14 billion rand across the university system. So ultimately, uh, not to dwell too much on the financial, but ultimately we have to do a number of things. Firstly, these are tough times and institutions have to manage their finances with great care at this time. University grants will come under increasing scrutiny um, at a time of fiscal constraints. Secondly, we must and we are trying to address the challenge of affordability and sustainability of student funding policy and support. This will require support from outside of government and continued support from institutions. Um, there's currently an MTT established by the uh, minister that is working on this issue and urgently trying to address the issue of a sustainable student funding model. We have also had annual agreements on tuition and accommodation fees um, for several years now and we're working towards a policy framework that will attempt to address this in the long term. Uh, this will be critical for ensuring the sustainability of the system going forward. Um, and while we are addressing the student funding challenge, we have to ensure the long-term sustainability for institutions. This is important for the whole post-school system. I am aware that the funding strategy group uh, will be discussing these issues uh, later in the, in, in the conference. So I, I would like to turn now to a brief discussion about ideas about the engaged university. Uh, and I'm quoting um, Professor Russell Botman, um, who is the, was the former vice chancellor of Stellenbosch University. Um, and he said, uh, this is in the foreword to a volume entitled Higher Education for the Public Good, Views from the South. And he said, higher education is not neutral. It is highly political. Universities have a particular place and role in society. From a critical point of view, the university should be a place of relevance. It should play a useful role in serving the needs of society. Higher education institutions do not occupy some mythical middle ground. They are deeply embedded in society. If they attempt to sit on the fence, they make themselves irrelevant. Society should hold institutions accountable against their contribution to the public good. And he went on to say, that the time has come for universities to take sides. They cannot just be players on the field, they need to pick a side and that side should be the public good. Um, so that's Russell Botman, may he rest in peace. And um, the editor of that volume was uh, Professor Brenda Leibovitz and also um, someone who I would pay tribute to and who should also rest in peace. Um, both very important people in our higher education system. In thinking about engaged universities then, as those that take into account the public good, a number of academics writing in the book that I've just quoted from reference the human development and capabilities approach as a multi-dimensional framework that provides rich opportunities for thinking about higher education and the public good. Of course, uh, Amacha Sen's work is well known in questioning the links between economic growth and human development. While higher education has uh, instrumental value, for example, in educating young people for employability, for entrepreneurship, and of course, developing useful skills, it has a deeper human value in expanding human capabilities, the freedoms for people to live the way, the life they value, and flourish or achieve well-being. And as Melanie Walker says, puts it, the development of knowledge for cultivating critical and creative intellectual capacities for meaningful lives. And this approach opens up many areas of exploration in terms of the purposes of higher education and the social structures within higher education institutions and the extent to which they may enable or constrain higher education access and success. 
And I wanted to just take this thinking forward a little bit in a brief discussion about some aspects of learning and teaching in the current moment. And I know that many in the conference will do this in more depth. Um, in 2020, we worked with the University of the Free State. We administered a student access to and use of learning materials survey. This was published late in 2020. It's available publicly. Um, we learned a lot from this survey. We learned that the COVID-19 pandemic pushed the sector to rapidly adapt to circumstances that very few in the sector had experienced before. Students' responses testified to the fact that South African institutions were able to adapt and engage with technologies to create a new way of offering teaching and learning. However, this does not mean that technology should replace teaching and learning, but it does imply that the sector is ready to embrace technology to enhance education. A number of recommendations came out of that study, which I won't go into. Some of them are fairly obvious in terms of needing to ensure that all staff and students have access to the basic learning infrastructure, uh, prioritizing digital skills development, uh, developing much more inflexible content delivery platforms, uh, more affordable use of textbooks uh, and open educational resources, and some other recommendations about uh, uh, financial aid and other areas. Um, technology, no doubt, then can be an enabler of change uh, and improvements to teaching and learning, and can also, uh, but can also hold higher education back if we're not able to address digital and technological inequalities that are inherent in our society, in our economy, and in our institutions. So from our reporting on the sector as the department, when we asked about student engagement in teaching and learning, we learned that Universities generally reported high levels of student participation in teaching and learning, with no universities reporting percentages higher than 10% for students who were not engaged, and four, only four in institutions reporting higher than 5%. The average percentage across the student, the system for students not engaged uh, in early in the, in the academic, uh, at the end of the academic year of 2020, but in January 2021, was very low at 2%, and it decreased even in February 2021. Maybe at that time, many, many uh, students were uh, maybe not on campus, although in some cases the academic year had started for some. Uh, concluding assessments were still underway. The point is that um, the report, we have, what we have been seeing in terms of reports is that participation was relatively high and of course student success also saw uh, uh, some improvements at least there's some reports that talk to this so there were good things about the forced move to remote teaching and learning um, but I do believe that we need to be cautious um, and the next part that I'm talking to is somewhat anecdotal I know there's a lot of research that uh, we will see start seeing the resu results of uh, I'm sure but when you look at the data in this way at a high level the system seems to be okay People are participating, they're accessing learning management systems. But when I've talked to academics, I get a very different perspective. Um, and, and then we are, need to ask questions about whether student success has really improved. And has the participation of students really been meaningful? Has technology allowed for improved success? Or has it in fact masked a number of underlying and enduring inequalities? There's documented concern about quality, about academic integrity, about assessment, and some concern about what the reduction in face-to-face -face methodologies has meant for meaningful engagement between students, uh, students and staff, and of course staff collaboration. So just to say the world is moving on, things will never be the same. Technology and pandemics are integrally part of, the li of our life going forward in higher education. South African institutions will have to adapt to this. The rest of the world is having to do so as well. Technology offers many positive opportunities for higher education, learning and teaching, and for blended and hybrid methodologies uh, to increase, and they will do so. However, in thinking about the engaged university, it is also critical to reflect on the human dimension, the people in higher education and the purposes of teaching and research. And we mustn't lose sight of this in pushing for change. Face-to-face -face engagement will not disappear and should not in a country that is still struggling to escape the dehumanization of the past. So in this sense, the engaged university must be cognizant of some of these debates. Chair, I'm looking at the time. Lucky I've got my computer in front of me. I know that I must conclude. Um, so I just wanted to say three things in conclusion. One is to note that people have lost a great deal over the past year. Many have lost family, many have lost friends and colleagues to the pandemic. Uh, many South Africans have lost their livelihoods. 
Lockdowns have had multiple effects on individuals and their families. For higher education, the adjustment to studying and working from home has been tough for many people. International research has shown a disproportionate negative effect on women, and this applies to students and staff in the higher education sector too. Others will focus on this, no doubt, but the effects of the pandemic on mental health is also something we are still discovering a lot about, and it may turn out to have been one of the most massive effects of the pandemic on people's well-being. But um, I wanted to end on a positive note and to, to say two things uh, that are really good about the system. And uh, in reflecting on the year in review, um, we have an organization called Higher Health. And to reflect on the role played by Higher Health that we work, works very closely with the department, with all the institutions in the system. And I think we would agree that we benefited enormously in having support from an organization that was able to provide support for our entire post-school sector through the challenges of the pandemic, from providing and mediating scientific advice, releasing guidelines and protocols on a range of issues, responding to on-campus challenges, providing training and many, many other things. And so I wanted to say thank you to Higher Health uh, uh, for assisting us in working collaboratively. And then also to say, as the minister noted uh, in his key keynote speech, um, in talking about the many scientific uh, uh, developments uh, in South Africa. The South African science system is actually really punching above its weight in the research field. It's a small system, uh, but the past few months of the pandemic have really shone a light on some of the great strengths of our research and innovation system. The incredible research in the health sciences field, in epidemiology, vaccine research, the discovery of variants, and many, many other areas as well as some of the social science research that has highlighted the many aspects of the social and economic effects of the pandemic. And I just wanted to end on a positive note and to say that this is really something to celebrate and build on. Chairperson, I hope I was within my time. Thank you very much. Dandy, that, that was great, uh, you know, well-timed, uh, expensive uh, as well, you know, and well-delivered. So many, many thanks for that, uh, Tandi, and for the prep that went into clustering those in such a great way. It's been very, very useful to hear you reflect on that. I'm handing over now to Prof. Sibongile Mutwa, the USAF uh, chairperson at the present moment, and of course, also the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Nelson Mandela. The Nelson Mandela University. Pramudwa, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Andre, uh, Professor Kiet, and uh, colleagues in the participating on the platform and at, at this very important conference uh, that we are uh, engaged in. I do want to uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Mtose as well for setting the tone for this session. I also want to acknowledge uh, the, the presentations by the earlier speakers who have done a good job of going uh, over some of the major formulations and conceptions, uh, as well as uh, practices and challenges uh, that we are going to have to face up to as we engage with the concept uh, of the engaged university and how does that university uh, look like or how could it look like uh, and uh, I want to 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 argue that um, what I would like to put across uh, uh, in my paper uh, which I'll go into uh, uh, briefly uh, is to uh, talk on the issue of uh, engagement at in the intersection at the intersection of engagement and transformation so uh, Dr. Lewin's presentation has provided a superb platform and contextualization for my own. So uh, I would like to start then by expressing uh, 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 your presentation, Tandi, as well as uh, just uh, 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 going over the sobering insights uh, that we have had to deal with since the pandemic started. This has brought home forcefully how an unanticipated global disruption uh, in the form of the pandemic in, in concert with ongoing technological advancement and dynamic socioeconomic and political contexts have propelled us into a comprehensive re-evaluation, uh, uh, reconfiguration and reconceptualizations of our universities, both nationally and globally. 
Uh, so I want to thank all that are present who have joined us for this session. Uh, your your, your um, presence is highly, highly uh, uh, um, appreciated. Those with a keen interest uh, in the sector are undoubtedly seeing that uh, there is a shifting locus and content of knowledge production. There is a growing number of learning organizations and businesses uh, external to the formal university sector. And according to an estimated 65% of knowledge is now being generated outside of the university. This calls into question our currency as many speakers have uh, mentioned this morning and relevance as the traditional institution, as traditional institutions of higher learning. Our value and in particular, our social sustainability will thus be determined uh, by our willingness and ability to learn uh, from the communities in whose names we exist and our responses to everyday life for meaningful impact and relevance. I'm going to just go through a few slides now, which um, uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, 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 relating to my brief uh, presentation. Uh, Prof Kiet, I will try to keep uh, within, within the time. Uh, more critically for South Africa, we must simultaneously also um, reconceptualize what it really means to be a transformative and responsive African university that is demonstrating the vision stated in our very own Department of Education 1997 White Paper 3, and at the same time reflect and build on the aspirations, cultures and knowledge system intrinsic to its geolocation and its peoples. Uh, I'm uh, going to just take you to my next slide. This paper, uh, which is uh, indeed a shortened and abridged version of the chapter that uh, uh, Professor Kiet and I have contributed to Chris Brink's uh, latest edited volume that will be launched uh, also in this conference. Uh, this short paper uh, engages with a, with a few uh, um, interwoven um, ideas, uh, uh, which I will touch on throughout the text. Uh, firstly, uh, what I, I will do is to reflect on the dominant character and orientation of the university on the South African higher education landscape that is trapped in a modern and colonial imaginary. Secondly, I will propose thinking and doing the university at the engagement transformation interface as a way to escape this imaginary I've just mentioned. Thirdly, uh, I will try and suggest a new imaginary that can only emerge on the basis of undoing of the university as we know it. As I ex uh, uh, mentioned this morning that uh, we are stuck in a situation where we try to maintain the tradition, but also try to subvert the university. So I will try and elaborate on that this afternoon. And fourthly, uh, I will uh, then uh, share with what I think that undoing, how it presupposes a radical reformulation of the notion of social justice, from which a different praxis can begin to take shape. Um, let me kick off then, and hopefully you can see the outlines of these ideas as I proceed. To date, the fundamental transformation required to give material effect to that vision has focused more on system systemic reconfiguration and global consonance and responsiveness. At the expense, I would like to suggest of genuine redress, equity, non-discrimination, and the development of a democratic ethos and culture of human rights through education practices, which uh, Professor Liz Lange, uh, on her work uh, in 2012, uh, she, in, she also mentions that this includes a uh, curricular content and its transmission. We have not seen the same energy being channeled into social justice praxis, colleagues, as the central, influential, transformative, and coherent force 
that was envisaged at the time of its conception. Paul Zeleza, uh, supported by a number of scholars, suggests that our reliance on our colonial inheritances has resulted in our universities being trapped in a dominant character, an orientation which, and I quote from him, which, pre, which reproduce old structures of inequality and produce new forms of marginalization, close quotes, but which have also delayed severely the progress towards the kinds of transformed institutions that were in, envisaged by us in post-apartheid policy and legislation. We should, I then propose, uh, that we reimagine the university at the engagement transformation interface, at what I like to refer to as the hubs of convergence. That is, for me, the co-creation of spaces, physical and otherwise, where we can transgress the conventional character of our universities and, and, and of the academy towards characterizations which delineate more deliberately our nascent revel revelation of the transformative, responsive African university. This requires a conscious letting go, in my view, um, of the conventional academic self and a deliberate receptiveness and openness to the knowledges of our communities and the education contributions that they are able to offer. An orientation to authentically engage with, the, with and revere the insights, practices, and imaginings that are rooted in, with, within historically marginalized ways of knowing and being without instrumentalizing them. This understanding of engagement and transformation also presupposes institutional transformation and changes in internal organization structures, dynamics, incentives, and recognition systems that allow the, advan the av advancement of new ways of developing its core academic missions of engagement. What is missing still? is a consideration of the inherent nature of the university. I suggest that a failure to address this deliberately and purposefully will inhibit any envisaged uh, transformation. Literature revealed, reveals multiple conceptualization of the nature or character of the university. But for purposes of this discussion, colleagues, Three are mentioned as contributors to the conceptualization of the transformative responsive universities. These are summarized and uh, paraphrased in the interest of, bre of brevity. Uh, I have actually not reached the slide that we are sharing, sorry about that. According to uh, uh, Gafkin and Morrissey, uh, cited uh, 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 in Sherrington, an engaged university, which is the first conception that I'm engaging with. Um, an, an, at an engaged university, research scholars would seek to promote an equal exchange between academy and community, which is rooted in a mutual partnership that fosters a formal, strategic, long-term collaborative arrangement. On the other, on the other hand, uh, relating to the civic university. Goddard, uh, uh, also supported by Brink, asserts that the civic university is the one that is actively engaged within, with the wider world as well as its local community. It takes a holistic approach to engagement. It has a strong sense of place as a contributor to its unique identity as an institution. I think this uh, uh, formulation of a civic uh, a university was engaged this morning. It also has a sense of purpose, understanding not just what it is good at, but what it is good for, as Professor Brink has, uh, has asked among other colleagues. Such a university is willing to invest in order to have impact beyond the academy. It is transparent and accountable to its stakeholders and the wider 
and the wider public. And I think Professor McCohen touched on this this morning. And it uses, the civic university uses innovative methodologies such as social media in its engagement activities with the world at large. Literature indicates that the civic university is growing in favor and currency as it moves as it moves towards being a part of the community that it names. Now, the responsive university responds to societal needs and sees such alignment and positioning as its responsibility. We note this responsive orientation and notion in the incorporation of universities into sustainable development goals, as it has been indicated uh, this morning, and a raft of other continent, continental and national developmental legislation like Agenda 63 as, and other policies uh, uh, and regulations. In, in this view, responsiveness presupposes an ambition and mutability that enable it to adjust its purpose and to impose various obligations upon itself in pursuing impact that is larger than what it could have initially predetermined for and by itself. Literature suggests six genres of responsiveness, uh, which are cited in the longer version of the chapter that I've mentioned, uh, which are employed. I cannot delve into these given the limits uh, of a presentation such as this one, but I'm sure uh, uh, colleagues will read that when they get hold of, the, of that work. It is sufficient to say that these genres seem to be driven by both external and internal imperatives and demands and challenges. In the South African context, unemployment, inequality, and poverty, together with environmental degradation, and the social and structural mooring of discrimination are key amongst these challenges. Now, uh, as I'm moving to my next, next uh, slide, uh, which is the crux uh, of my argument. An emancipatory reading of the responsive university envisaged, and this is the crux of the argument we are making, is one that responds to the needs of the communities as articulated by communities themselves and co-constructed with the universities. So you can imagine the shift uh, in this conceptualization. But to be able to hear these articulations in their authenticity requires deep institutional transformation within the university and its academy. Hence the proposition of the transformative responsive university. For a university to have the dexterity and capacity to be civic and responsive, it has to strive to be, trans to be a transformative university. And the transformative university will develop more productive capacity for responsiveness. And I would like to argue again that it will set better serve its civic mandate. Our universities thus need to embed transformative praxis, which interrogates and seeks to disrupt that which is taken for granted, uh, that transforms organizations from current dysfunctions towards greater efficiency and effectiveness, productivity and competitiveness, and that harnesses moral purpose intellectual and social development and the focus on social justice, just to reframe uh, 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 the work of Shields and others. Framed from by our ongo ongoing captivity in a colonial imaginary of the university, we are called upon, and I quote from Stain again, to, re to rethink the dominant frames within which our imaginaries and institutions are embedded, a uh, close quote. This would require undoing ourselves, I argue, stepping away from ourselves to see more clearly the hidden determinants that constitute the habitus 
of our academic selves. In other words, the transformative responsive university presupposes an internal disruptive social justice orientation as a requirement for an equalizing responsiveness towards society and communities. This, I argue, calls for a different imagination around the idea uh, of a university which is akin to the need that Bauer uh, has as, uh, in 2018 suggested for, and I quote from him, universities to be deliberate, to deliberately shape themselves to address the creation of intellectual, social, physical meshes between themselves and the struggles and aspirations of their communities, I close quote. To do this, universities need to be intensely student-centered and engaged, being tightly bound to their context and geared towards addressing the challenges of local communities, industry, government, non-governmental organizations, uh, to paraphrase Bauer again in his 2017 work. Such reframing, however, entails the deliberate denaturalization of the epistemological and ontological categories and assemblages that enable, and I quote, higher education as we know it to exist and persist. If we fail to identify, uh, Stain reminds us, and unravel these assemblages, then it will be difficult to create and hold space for other possibilities, not only to emerge, but to thrive, I close quote. In our South African context, colleagues, our modern colonial interpretive horizon is powerfully structured by racialized and heteropatriarchal polity and higher education system. The minister spoke to this this morning. The unequal distribution of human wealth linked to socioeconomic status and the neoliberal and capitalist regimes of accumulations that constitute the university as such. And these must of necessity be deeply interrogated and progressively dismantled towards institutions that reflect more genuinely the constituencies of which they are members. And then as I move to my last slide, uh, as I move to conclude, uh, Professor Kiet, um, Tra a tra the transformative, uh, can we move to my next slide now? The transformative resp responsive university, uh, I argue, can mitigate the challenges of dwindling public legitimacy and trust in higher education while being a mechanism by which we puncture the standard conventional character and orientation of the university. And then I pose uh, uh, just four um, points, uh, which uh, are concluding ideas, which we will need to pay attention to uh, for us to uh, work through this project. Firstly, we will need uh, to acknowledge the reality of being steered by a modern colonial imaginary that is deeply implicated in the inequalities of the local and the global, which informs, shapes, and frames as part of an ideological fabric, all of our organizing concepts, principles, practices, and engagement. Professor uh, uh, Mamukheti Pakeng touched on this in her session this morning. Uh, secondly, uh, we need to face up to challenges to unravel the, the assemblages which demand the undoing of the academic self. The psychoaffective dimensions of radical change, thereby ch changing the character of the university. Thirdly, we need to acknowledge that in order to engage with the academic self, the transformative responsive university is rooted in an in interrogating self-reflectivity that incorporates the notion of transformative change. And this is a continuous project. 
Fourthly, uh, there is a need uh, for us to uh, align with plural conceptions of social justice and not only those which have hitherto been incorporated into strategic plans and annual reports of universities. We need to work farther than that. I have seen many interventions, um, and I'm sure we all have, across our sector that are working towards these requirements that I've mentioned, from which I have sourced my thoughts and arguments. However, because we seem captured by dominant narratives of social justice that seamlessly connect with the reproduction of inequalities. I then assert that more work needs to be done to develop a new dynamic radical social justice framework that will reflect the ideals of the transformative responsive university in South Africa. I would like to argue then colleagues that uh, we have difficult yet rewarding and urgent work to do. Uh, and I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Thank you, Professor Mutwa. Also well-timed uh, and expensive as well. So it's great uh, for those thoughts coming through. Uh, let, me, let me move immediately, uh, you know, without uh, taking the time and space that others would need to engage with the, with the contributors. Um, there are a couple of uh, responses uh, in the chats, um, and they are spread across the, the different contributions, Prof. Ntozi, Dr. Lewin, and Prof. Uh, uh, Mutwa. Prof. Ntozi, can we kick off with you, Kanye's question around the public society as an equal partner proposition that you put forward? How can universities ensure that this is not simply rhetoric? Prof. Tozi, can you, can you please engage with that? And then I'll come to uh, Tandi and Prof. Mutwa after that. <laughs> That's a big question. And so uh, we've got to aspire to get it right uh, by ensuring that they are not just appendixes, you know, and afterthought, because the, the, the issue here is that the very students who are training are from the society. And therefore, if we, we, we get the society to come on board as, 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 as partners to the universities, what that would mean is that we, we, we you know, we've dealt so much with what we call um, community engagement. But the question we've got to ask ourselves as higher education institutions is whether what we call community engagement is indeed community engagement, because I, I remember working for one institution where we were trying to really bring the voices of the community within the university this complex. I don't know how to respond to uh, the question, but I, I just want to say that it's important that we try by all means that the voices of the public are also respected, because if we separate the public from the universities that we, we, we serve, what we are doing, therefore, is, is unfair because we're training graduates uh, for the, the community and the, 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 the graduates that we train, uh, Professor Kate, if they are for the public, therefore institutions of higher learning cannot work in isolation. We need the public's voice within our institutions. I'm not sure if I, I'm answering that person correctly, but it's not something like uh, Professor Mutwa has, has presented here, actually in responding on the discourse of talking about an engaged university. So it's a broad uh, question that can be answered over this, uh, this uh, platform at the moment. But I think the presentation by uh, Professor Mutwa was actually responding to the very question on the how and how do we conceptualize actually the community engagement or working with society as equal partners. Uh, that, that is lovely problem, Tonsa. Eh? Uh, perhaps uh, perhaps uh, Tandi and Prabhupada want to come in on the same question. Um, Prabhupada Tandi? Um, 
Well, um, uh, can I can I can I sort of attempt? Um, what 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 uh, what what uh, I I I always um, well what I've I've been trying to say uh, uh, even let me just today is that um, we we are not going to be able to do the difficult work of um, a truly engaged university that is integrative uh, of the knowledge traditions and, and influences which the university has done a lot of good work, but actually has underplayed uh, uh, those uh, notions of knowledge and knowledge creation uh, and uh, ways of doing and being uh, that um, the communities in whose name we exist have uh, worked with. Uh, so the, the university, uh, in my view, uh, to fulfill its civic role as it is coming uh, uh, across uh, uh, quite um, eloquently uh, in the writings that I have referred to, including uh, Chris and, and, and Stein and others, is that uh, that work can only be done uh, or attempted uh, uh, appropriately and perhaps uh, with much more impact if uh, we allow ourselves the dexterity and the malleability as well as the humility uh, uh, in our understanding that uh, the knowledge project is much more expansive uh, than what the university has hitherto brought into the space. So uh, for me, it's not only uh, the, 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 it's, it, it goes beyond the transactional and, and perhaps an obligational uh, 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 approach uh, of the university uh, as an engaged institution, but it goes to the heart uh, of the reaffirmation of social justice. Uh, and I would then want to argue that if the university is not prepared to subvert itself and question some of the practices uh, in which it has projected itself in, the, in, in society. It is not able to have the flexibility uh, to do the work that uh, we are uh, uh, expecting from the university. So for me, uh, the, 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 the question of the character of the university cannot remain untouched while it claims to be successfully doing the work of, of a challenging nature, like what uh, the earlier speakers and Professor Bauer put uh, in front of us this morning. Thanks, uh, thanks, Prof Mutwa. Um, Tandi, th there's a question around the question, you know, around students with disabilities and impairments and um, the efforts and resources, uh, you know, mobilized by the department can you can you respond to that please have you have you um, captured the entire uh, framing uh, in the chat or would you like me to read it to you Candy? i don't have access to the chat so i'm just going to rely on oh. what you're saying um, okay can i read it to you then yes read it to me yeah, were, were there specific interventions for students with disabilities? Have there been studies done by DEA to gauge how these groups of students were assisted? Because surely we, can't, we cannot bundle them up as a group. So like differentiating between students uh, with disabilities uh, and, and others. So can, can you please respond to that then, Tandi? Sure, Prof. So, I mean, I think there are, I mean, there are, obviously going to be different institutional um, interventions on this. So uh, it may really have depended very much on, on what institutional responses were available. Um, certainly there's um, uh, very key uh, is the support that National Student Financial Aid Scheme provides for students with disabilities. And in fact, um, students qualify on the basis of a different uh, family income threshold if they do have disabilities and they qualify for particular kinds of support that other students do not get. So in terms of devices uh, and, and other kinds of assistance, 
And the other, the other thing that's changed uh, quite significantly, although this is not necessarily linked to the pandemic, has just been the, you know, the, the work around infrastructure in the system and the, the development of, of, of uh, new infrastructure in the system and, and the importance of, of accessibility in relation to that. And, and I think particularly um, what we're seeing as well in terms of the focus on ICT infrastructure and how that also needs to be um, inclusive in a sense so that it's able to be accessed by all students. But I'm not aware of specific studies or information. I think at institution level, there may well have been specific interventions. I know institutions were doing a lot of surveying of students um, during the pandemic, um, but certainly the, the, the work that I'm not aware of, uh, uh, the work that I'm aware of hasn't focused much on, on this issue. And I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that students with disabilities will have faced particular problems that other students may not have faced. Um, mm. just, on, just on the other question, um, uh, uh, on the other question, I just think that, I mean, um, uh, not being an academic, but being a bureaucrat, just in terms of the, of the, non, the, the issue of, of making these ideas not rhetorical and, and how to actually make them uh, uh, real. I think, I mean, I think that the, the many people have talked to this, and in fact, Prof Mutwa started with this in her in introduction about the idea that, you know, universities really risk, they kind of risk losing the the status that they have, the, 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 the belief that society has in universities is, is at risk. Um, and I know, you know, um, other people have talked about this quite often, the risk that universities have of lo losing the support of their publics. And, and part of that is, is, is also just about, I mean, part of it is about a perception of accountability. Now, I know we don't need more reporting necessarily, but certainly how institutions are able to engage with their publics is quite important. Often people see, uh, you know, p people see uh, knowledge, don't see knowledge and how, how it's affecting their lives. I wonder how many South Africans know, um, you know, how much the, the, the COVID-related work that's taken place in the research system has actually had a very real impact um, on their lives under COVID. And so I think it's partly about different kinds of, of engagement that universities take. It's partly also about seeing, uh, pe people seeing themselves in institutions, who teaches in institutions, who students are. Um, but otherwise, I do, I do think there's a risk of, of, of losing the support of, of, the, of the public. Uh, but but it, it is, it, it, it's, I mean, it's an ongoing issue. It's, it's, it is about how universities engage, but obviously it's also about how they change and, and engage differently, so. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Tandy. I, I hope that the, that the contributors have a pen and paper ready because I'm going to go, I'm going to scroll down the chats and cluster them so that we also save time. Uh, and um, there's also a disability symposium coming up. So if, um, if that person can just, uh, you know, connect with me uh, privately, I can give that details. I think it's sometimes next week or, or the week after next. Um, yeah, there's another question, Tandi, around the student funding model, which you just have to make a note of quickly from Anele Kabingezi. Um, can you just check on that? It has to do with the growing demand for higher education and the training opportunities to access the economy and whether the work around a sustainable student funding model has progressed. Tandi, if you can make a note on that. Then of course, uh, Prof Mutwa undoing the university again. Could this relate to the idea of Ivan Illich's concept of de-schooling society? I haven't heard that uh, author in a long time, uh, but he was quite critical uh, in the 1980s when we did education studies around uh, radical conceptions of schooling. Undoing the university, de-schooling society, Prof Mutwa, can you uh, prepare to respond to uh, that particular comparison? And then from Denise Zinn, uh, wanting Prof Mutwa to respond to the reference to Noah's principle this morning, uh, and also to give some examples of arcs that have been built that exemplify these ideals around the question of how transformation can be fa facilitated. Uh, Prof Mutwa as the vice chancellor, uh, how, how do you as a vice chancellor, you know, facilitate building um, these ideals within the university? 
And then of course, uh, the, there's another question on deliberate naturalization, uh, Prof Mutwa, what would be the first practical steps in drastically changing cause? Things look differently tomorrow, for instance, for example, incorporating knowledges of communities into the curriculum. Would the whole process of curriculum approval and implementation have to be fast tracked? I'm gonna stop there now. If I have gone too quickly, uh, please just let me know. I can repeat some of these. Prof. Tosi, please feel free uh, to come in and any of these questions. Tandi, yours are not only limited to the student funding model. Uh, please feel free to also chime in on any of the other questions that I've raised as well. Uh, Prof. Tosi, would you like to go first and then I'll give to Prof. Mutwa? Thank you. Uh, if the question to why it belongs to the chairperson, uh, it belongs to <laughs> Professor Mut. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, problem <laughs> Prof. Prof. <laughs> please continue. <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, 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 for those questions. They are very difficult ones. I'm not uh, uh, going to, to, to claim that uh, we have the answers. And uh, as you can see that... Uh, I ended uh, uh, my, my submission at a point where I was saying that we have a lot of deep, of, of, deep, of deep thinking that we need to do, but also we need courage uh, to really even begin to, to, to um, Firstly, I, I, as, I, as I said, that I think it's important to accept the fact that uh, the, the frames which have formed us and placed us where we are uh, as the university uh, need to be interrogated. And perhaps need to be, um, we, we need to begin to subvert them in order to be able to to um, sit in society from a sitting position, to uh, um, listen in uh, and to learn from what that we do not know. Because it, it is actually not a, a common uh, a, a, a comportment of a, of a university to actually say that there are ways of knowing and doing and being that uh, have been there that do not come from us. And uh, that uh, we can actually mobilize this to improve and enhance and advance the impact of the university. So for me, uh, I think that is the fundamental question. And of course, the university is a large system and uh, I have no illusions uh, about this uh, proposition because um, we, we, the, the, the university has got like thousand years at the back of it. And I think the, the professor from UCL this morning gave us a, a succinct history uh, of uh, where the university uh, uh, comes from and what uh, uh, sort of buttresses uh, its character. But uh, what uh, we, are, we are saying, in fact, the, the essence of what I was presenting is that um, the proposition that we are putting forward of a responsive university that is civic-minded cannot happen without the university gaining sufficient courage to question a lot of what it has colluded with uh, uh, in its approach to the knowledge project. So uh, uh, that is, that is uh, obviously uh, not, I'm not claiming that uh, it needs to be said and it needs to be done, but I'm not saying it's easy. And, uh, and I know that uh, earlier on, and I think it is all embedded in these questions, that uh, the project that, uh, and the proposition that we're putting forward is so large and, and probably um, uh, uh, impractical that it cannot be imagined. But uh, I am saying that uh, 
uh, we need to start somewhere and then uh, uh, we to 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 actually uh, go and take your scholarship and and open it up uh, to the notions of knowledge uh, that uh, um, I exist outside the university and the academy, I think is a starting point. And then people like uh, uh, Catherine Odora Hoppers have actually written quite eloquently about this, not about uh, education as in a formalized institution, but also uh, the, 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 the positive of what uh, is uh, what is developmental about education? What is it that is in these concepts that talks to my own self-understanding as a person that actually is outside the university? So, I, for, for me, those are the are the are the question uh, questions that uh, we we need to 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 be to be sufficiently courageous to address, and then. Perhaps the question of this schooling society is something that I would want to, 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 to pr probably walk away from uh, 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 and then in favor of this schooling the university. Uh, I, I, would, I would like to, 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 to say that perhaps it is the university that needs to uh, denaturalize, need to uh, step out of itself, as I've often said, so that the university sees itself with clarity. Uh, the university needs to give itself a stranger value because some of which you live with every day, I think uh, you stop seeing it as problematic because it is the norm. And then for us to, to do the project of changing the academic project for the impact that uh, uh, we seek, which uh, my colleagues have spoken to. Because the only addition that, uh, uh, I think the, the main addition of what I'm, I've put forward this afternoon is not what has not been said, but the, the only additional angle is the question whether the university does have the capacity and the courage and the inclination to disown to disown uh, what that it holds dear, which is uh, at the center of what makes it sit above uh, society. So for me, uh, that is that is the question. But of course, uh, a, a, a colleague, I think in the chat is asking about the practicalization of this. Because the practicalization of this means that uh, you need to, you cannot, uh, well, that is just my view. Uh, uh, and I don't think that you can uh, um, have impactful engagement by proxy, uh, by uh, uh, um, perpetuating uh, a community service uh, uh, um, um, narrative. Uh, uh, my view is that uh, actually uh, the, 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 the curriculum, uh, uh, the, the commanding uh, responses, the evidence that we need to, to, to respond to the uh, 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 global challenges that face our society. Uh, in my view, can can have better impact and can be constructed better if uh, we co-create from the position of not know of not having all the answers because we do not otherwise uh, uh, um, um, uh, the uh, inequality and poverty uh, uh, would not be as sustained as we as it is when there is progress. Uh, in knowledge. So uh, we need then to say, to even question, what is that advancement in knowledge if knowledge is not able to improve the human condition? And, and for me, uh, uh, and I think probably that is the main uh, challenge that I'm putting in front of us to, to um, 
perhaps consider for a moment the possibility of turning on, on its head all that uh, uh, we have believed uh, to be true and to be uh, um, uh, 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 I suppose paramount about the nature of the knowledge project. Uh, so for me uh, is a question of, uh, because obviously, uh, and then I think it is you Andre that you have spoken uh, about, uh, is it possible to have a university within the university? Because uh, obviously we are not able, uh, in my view, we are not able to move the system as a whole at the same time to the notions of a, a responsive transformative university that we are talking about. But uh, what we are capable of doing as some of the universities, including my own, have attempted in, with some projects that uh, seem to show that it is possible to expand the impact uh, of your contribution if you uh, let uh, in to the academy the knowledge is that have hitherto been under, uh, uh, undermined and uh, set aside. Uh, that, is, that, is, uh, that is too long. My apologies, Andrew. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Professor Mudwa. Uh, Dr. Lewin, I hope you're not going to dismiss me like uh, Prof. Toze did. Would you, would you want to respond to that sustainable funding model for students? And then also, if you want to take a bite um, at the questions that Prof. Mutua responded to, please feel free to do so. And um, we're running out of time. We have seven minutes to go. And then I'll see there's a number of other comments coming through in the chat as well. I'll wrap them up. Uh, and we can also engage bilaterally outside of the session uh, with the colleagues. Thank you so much for the interest and for the energy in the chat. Uh, Tandi? Thanks, Prof. Um, I got. I can actually. I I now access the chat, so I can see what. And I've got two questions. Oh, lovely. Can you then? Okay, then then Tandi, you can respond to one of those lower comments as well mm, around a, the funding around the funding, funding model for engagement in universities. Yeah, okay. I will do that. So Thanks. I mean, just very briefly on the student funding model, um, Anela, we will. Uh, be, I'm sure we'll be coming to Parliament soon to report on that, but um, we do have some urgent uh, funding challenges. And of course, what we need to do is to build in the long term a sustainable student funding model uh, that, is, uh, that is something that we need to think and plan through very carefully in terms of how it will work. But I think, um, and, and other people have, uh, have spoken to this idea this is not my idea, but the idea of an ecosystem in the sense that government is not going to um, deal with the funding and the debt problems on its own. Um, if you see if you see this, and there's a session uh, uh, in the FSG a bit later, you can come to that session if you want to see a little bit more detail what's actually going on in terms of the funding of the system. If you see the, the incredible increase in student funding and the, 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 the proximity of the student funding budget to the total university subsidy budget, it gives you a sense that, that the sustainability is a real issue of concern for us. So government's not going to do this alone. And one of the things that has happened as part of the review process is to actually go back and look at work that has, already, has been done over time uh, in government to, to address issues of, of student funding. And, we, and, and also to go back to the presidential commission, the Hare Commission that um, produced its report in 2017 and really look into some of the recommendations that have been made there and revisit those recommendations in terms of what we have already done. So, so that is some of the work that's underway and it's not going to happen overnight, uh, but certainly we're going to have to um, work not just with, the, with, with uh, the universities, but with the private sector, with the banks, uh, with with um, uh, other government departments and, and, and really try and come to a, a, a set of multiple uh, funding modalities that can support students and, and, re and, and address some of the problems. Um, the other issue is there was a question about the resourcing of community engagement. It's often something that we get asked about. Uh, um, I, I think, um, I mean, I think the first point I would make is that funding on its own is not... Uh, it doesn't resolve 
the problems. And, and, and much of what's been spoken about is, is to do with sort of policy frameworks and orientation and political will at institution level. But also the key thing about community engagement is that um, what the research shows is that it works, it, it's part of teaching and learning, it's part of the core activities of, of what universities do. It's part of research that gets done, it's part of uh, teaching and learning. It's not something, uh, I mean, some aspects of it maybe, but it's not something that stands on its own. You don't just uh, see community engagement as a standalone activity. It should be integrated into the core work of the university. Uh, and, and so I think that when that happens, um, universities are really able to think about uh, how they can incentivize uh, more community engagement and, and better engagements around some of the issues that are being uh, uh, raised. And of course, if you, if you take the arguments that Prof Mutwa is, is raising, and it's really about rethinking, you know, in a sense, rethinking everything in the way in which everything is being done and, you know, sort of radically in a way transforming uh, the way teaching and learning and research takes place and what that means for engagement. So I would say, in a way, um, it, it's not really about, uh, it's not about making specific funding on, on, uh, available on its own, not to say that there isn't benefit in that to a certain extent, but uh, universities really need to think about the core work of the universities and how engagement is part of this. Thanks. Thanks, Tandy. Thanks, Prof. Mutwa. Thanks, uh, Prof. Mutose. Uh, can I just wrap up now for the last uh, three minutes, uh, just so that um, the colleagues know that their questions um, have been rooted into the space and we can find other ways of dealing with that. Um, Barbara Smith, uh, Tandy, of course, raised the question of, of how the community engagement, but of course, as you would know, this discussion is beyond that as the engaged university. Okay, one can also flip it around, eh? but how the university rethink its core mandate of engagement. I suppose that is what we, we the, the main thematics on, on the table at the present moment. And then um, how African knowledge creation and utilization is being incorporated into the knowledge project uh, of the university. Some of these notions around knowledge democracy uh, that needs to come in there. There was earlier questions around community and societal participation within the structures of the university. There's one of the courageous things that universities may want to think about. How do communities make, make up part of their committee systems and so on? And how do those voices get unmoderated space within the university, the, within the university's architectures? Then I think there's a Chanel van Merwe, the language question. Um, uh, Prof Mutua again on how the universities uh, can intervene, you know, around the notion of its own re reorientation around the language question and what responsibilities it has towards uh, the communities of which it is a member. And then the question of resourcing must also address. Chanel, you can engage with Prof. Butua, um, you know, bilaterally on that one. And then anonymous, unfortunately, that question has been responded to. Jenny, um, the, this is a very interesting point that Jenny is also raising, and it's the role of uh, private higher education and, and how do we interface with our two systems at the present moment to see how we can drive, uh, you know, the idea of the engaged university. So, so Jenny, that is also something that um, we will make land here. It will be part of the conference uh, reporting ideas as well. Um, and I know that there's an academic conference on private higher education next week, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, so, so we will have to think about the, the different uh, configurations of higher education in our country so that we integrate and engage with this, uh, you know, beyond, you know, between the public and the private sector as far as higher education is concerned. Colleagues, it is now 3 p.m. Can I um, just say a huge thank you to everybody who has attended uh, and a huge thank you for the energy uh, in the chats, the engagements, and of course, a great thank you to the technical team and those who have held this together, you know, from that perspective, but lastly, to our contributors, Prof Mtoze, Prof Mutwa, and Dr. Lewin, thank you so much. See you uh, in the uh, parallel sessions later on. Thank you so much.